Good evening. My name is Uta Poigand. I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities um, at Northeastern. So as we are getting settled in this um, very interesting and beautiful space, it's really a pleasure to welcome all of you this evening to this culminating and beginning um, event for the Humanities Center. The director of the Humanities Center, Dr. Nieves, who is somewhere here and who will say a few words in just a second, has really um, called us all together and with the great support of Tanya Munya, the administrator of the Humanities Center, has called us all together. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much to both of you and to all the supports for this evening. They have called us together both in order to mark um, the end of an intense year of fellowship interactions and also to mark the beginning of a new one. Of course, also to generate broader conversations at the same time around the tables with our speaker this evening um, and um, in, in general in the spirit of what can we do in the humanities in order to really have truly public, truly digital humanities that have a very strong grounding in thinking about how to do responsible work with the communities that surround us in academia that are sometimes further away from us, from our locations of campuses as well. But the theme is definitely one of how to think with communities um, into the future. It's also a very nice moment because I think the two themes of the fellowships, in fact, um, are in sync with un one another in a certain sense. And I just have to turn to the notes here briefly. I just want to remind you that we are just ending reimagining reforming, which our colleague um, between the law school and um, CSSH, Pat Williams, guided this year. And that under the leadership of uh, Regine Jean Charles, we are embarking now on world making, world building. And the little preview that Dr. Chambliss gave me this afternoon of his talk leads me to believe that his talk fits very well into these transitions um, as well. So it's just a real thrill to be here, and it's a thrill to turn over the mic to Dr. Nieves, who will do more formal introductions of our speaker and our program today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean Poiger. Uh, thanks so much to Tanya, who uh, has done an amazing job at getting us uh, sorted and together for a great evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Julian Chambliss, to Northeastern this evening. I have had the good fortune of working with him on a number of occasions over the past few years, and have always been so humbled by his generosity as a scholar and practitioner of black DH and black and Africana studies. He's a prolific scholar who's committed to social justice and community engagement in every way possible. He speaks passionately about our role as scholars, as scholars of color, and what our responsibilities are to the next generation of scholars coming up after us. As many of you know, I've suffered a great personal loss with the death of my husband less than a month ago. And Julian's presence here today reminded me of how important it is to remember how we're all part of an interconnected past, present, and future with our ancestors. And that we cannot forget what our obligations are to fulfilling the promises of our lives. That we may not always have a very clear vision of what those might be at certain moments in our lives, but that moments of reflection and self-care are critical if we're going to continue to do the important, difficult, and challenging work at primarily white institutions of holding them accountable for making the necessary social changes needed for a better, more diverse future. Dr. Julian Chambliss served as professor of history in the Department of History at Rollins College from 2004 to 2018. He joined the Department of English at Michigan State in fall 2018 as co-director for the Digital Humanities and Literary Cognition Lab. Faculty lead for the Graphic Possibilities Research Workshop and as core faculty in the Consortium for Critical Diversity in the Digital Age Research, or CDAR. He makes me tired reading all of the many titles. We actually laughed this morning about our very long signature lines in our emails. He teaches courses exploring critical making, comics, and culture in the United States. 
In 2019, Dr. Chambliss joined the MSU Museum as the Val Berryman Curator of History. As a teacher scholar concerned with community, identity, and power, he designs generative digital projects that use the classroom as a platform for students to act as co-researchers to trace community development, document diverse experiences, and explore culture. He's been recognized for his community engagement work with the Rollins College Cornell Distinguished Service Award and a Florida Campus Compact Service Learning Faculty Award. He's also on the advisory board for Northeastern's Mellon-funded Reckonings Project. Dr. Chambliss serves as a member of the Steering Committee for Haystack and as a national planner for the Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities, which he asked me to give a talk this year uh, at, and I was humbled to do that, Zora. Fabulous, speaking of ancestors. He's also a board member of the Society for City and Regional Planning History and a board member for the Comic Study Society. He is prolific, as I said. He is a busy man. He's taken time out of his schedule to be with us. And um, I couldn't think of a better person to bring together both of our years, this and our next. Uh, and tonight's talk, A Tale of Data Covery, the Black Experience and the Digital Public Record. Uh, I welcome Julian Chambliss. I want you to know that Angel said I had to sit there for the whole time. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I, as is always the case with academics, made too many slides, so I'm going to be going really fast. But I will stick to my time, so we'll have some time for Q&A, and I'm going to make sure I do that by setting the timer and punishing myself. Um, as I said, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about my work. And I'm going to start with an image uh, by a colleague of mine, John Jennings and Stacey Robinson of Sankofa. This is an image that means a lot to me because it really calls attention to the idea um, that you can go back and to get, right? Go back and get. This is the, the image that we associate with, the saying we associate with this image. It's very important in Afrofuturism, but I also think it's crucial to understanding the nature of the work that we do as scholars of color dealing with culture. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is my own personal story here, but it's really in that story that I learned important lessons about the nature of digital humanities and how cultural studies really depended on our ability to tell stories of the community and listen to the stories they have to tell. I sort of codified this along with a colleague in a recent publication in the Journal of Scholarly Editing. And there we talked about the idea of something called general, generative digital reciprocity, or GDR. This idea is really sort of something that came to myself through a series of interactions that have built up over time. And as Angel referenced, a lot of my work with Edenville has been very instructive in creating this context. Recovery is central to the work that I do as a scholar. What I'm trying to recover has everything to do with the stories that are being told by African Americans today, about yesterday, and about stories they have and visions they have for the future. My generative practice is inherently interdisciplinary because ultimately, in order to tell those stories and understand what people need, we have to draw on a wide-ranging methodological toolkit. Now, for myself, obviously, as someone who thinks about digital humanities, I'm very influenced by Kim Gallen and the idea of a black digital humanities. And I'm always mindful of her point here that the black digital humanities is less a thing and more of a space. And in that space, we have to fill our own set of goals and tools to tell stories about people of color. I want to highlight how technology employed in an unexamined context can tell really important stories. For me, this started and is part of a broader set of narratives that uh, really reshaping digital humanities. I'm always mindful of the recent work by people like my colleague, Angel, uh, that are really calling attention to the ways that digital humanities has to take into account race and its constructive nature. I'm also really interested in the, the sort of idea of black code studies as an intersection with this concern. Because in black code studies, if you did not see this special issue from the black scholar, they call attention to the ways that institutional knowledge 
has to not necessarily be the only marker by which we understand knowledge creation. That there are other ways that we can make value when it comes to information creation. Now, for me, this digital turn is intimately connected to, to community. I'm gonna tell a little bit about my own story, but in doing so, I hope to call attention to the ways that these ideas about di black digital humanities and listening to the community are crucial to the transformative practice that are so important to us as scholars. I started my career at a small liberal arts college called Rollins. There are roughly 2,000 students there. It was a institution that was dedicated to uh, undergraduate education, very few graduate programs. So a lot of my work with students really as a historian turned towards community-based work, first in oral history, in which I started to understand the deep and complex black experience that shaped Central Florida, something that is clear to many people. Over time, as using my classroom as a, a sort of platform, as I came to think of it, we interacted with community members to create digital projects that were deliberately designed to codify these stories, experiences, and communities that existed that were often overlooked and erased in the general, generally affirmed narrative of the community. One prime example of this is the story of Winter Park as a community totally omits the fact that black people were integral to the founding of the town, and if they had not voted for the town charter, it would not have been created as a town. After doing a number of projects where we documented this, eh, that's not what I wanted to do. This guy, which you can't see, that guy, Gus Henderson, he was the leading black Republican. And now, if you go and listen to the history of Winter Park, they actually talk about Gus Henderson. He's a founding father. But that was not the case so many years ago. Working on projects through our sort of um, undergraduate research program, I were able to create things like Golden Personality, which was a digital uh, encyclopedia that also documented white leaders that founded the town, but also black leaders like Henderson. But working in the archive, I was also able to call attention, I was also brought, able to call attention to the fact that Zora Neale Hurston, who grew up just two miles from my university, the college in, in Winter Park, had a very strong and very close relationship with Rollins College. If you read the books of Zorna Hurston, you'll note that she thanks actually in each one of her books at the very beginning, professors from Rollins College. They helped her get published. She herself taught at Rollins College at a time that no black person was allowed on campus. She brought citizens from Eatonville to do performances. And so, that strong connection to Zordia Hurston, a figure who I always have thought of as critically under, underappreciated as a thinker and an activist, really became a, a kind of framework for a different kind of digital investigation. So the project that you see here called Mosaic used the many different ways that Zordia Hurston investigated, documented, showcased black culture as a vehicle to get a number of students and faculty on campus to do those similar kinds of investigations through their own disciplines. So anthropologists did anthropological work, historians did historical work, scientists even looked at race and science. This was a great project that allowed us to really tell stories about the black experience and to think about the archive in our own institution and the neighborhood archives as a, a resource that could transform the narratives being explained about black people in Central Florida. Throughout this work, one of the things I came to understand is how difficult it was for the community to engage with us when we created our digital artifacts. So one of the outcomes that were associated with this was the need for us to create public exhibitions that could be placed in community spaces, in banners, and be in libraries that were more accessible to the public and allowed them to have some understanding of the ideas represented by Zoya Hurston that we were trying to bring to the fore. The work with Zoya Hurston was my first sort of foray into working with Eatonville more directly. I learned important lessons in this process, one around that question of trust, when uh, an elder in the community said, I'm not gonna give you this thing that I knew should be in a museum, but she wanted me to know that she had it. And I thought to myself, and I'm not proud of this, this was a long time ago, I'm a better person now, I should take it from that lady, because when she dies, 
is going to disappear, and it ought to be in a museum, right? Like, it ought to be in a museum. And I really wrestled with the idea that, as an academic, I knew better than what she knew. What she knew is that this was her family's thing, and she was not going to give it to me. But she knew that I cared about history, so she wanted to show it to me, which is, on the one hand, a measure of how much she actually believed in me, but on the other hand, one of those things that made me really think, what am I doing when I interact with the community in Eatonville? Over time, in order to do more, to learn more, we developed a more sort of cohesive set of conversation-based approaches to Eatonville. Opening the community as much as possible to Eatonville through the Zoya Hurston Festival. The festival happens every year in the last week of January. So obviously a great time to visit Florida. And at the same time, the festival is a, a call to everyone who believes in the work of Zoya Hurston and believes in the vision of Eatonville. And so one of the things that we increasingly tried to do was to understand that ideological landscape created by that community of practice, by the people in Eatonville, by the organization that put on the festival, the Association of the Preserved Eatonville Community. So we, do it, we started to do oral histories that turned into a podcast. And that podcast, every time I got to confess, became a way for us to sort of both document the members of the community, but also those people who are inspired by the idea of Eatonville. Over time, we were, became very strong partners with the festival, and eventually, elements of the academic component actually took place on Rollins College campus. So as we were able to invite well-known um, scholars and artists to the festival, they would appear on campus to give talks, and we could document that for the record. One of the things that became clear in my close work with the festival is that while I had a long and complex history, featuring the participation of noted scholars and artists, Nikki Giovanni, Henry Louis Gates, Cornell West, Ozzie Davis. Much of that information, much of what happened on the ground was gone. It only really existed in an archive that most people, except for the leader of the organization, a woman named N.Y. Nathiri, she knows where everything is. Everybody else asks her where it is. And it's impossible at some level to truly understand the depth of the cultural conversation that's taken place at the Zora Festival over time. And because of that, it became one of the things that we wanted to do in our interactions with them is to provide a platform to record, to document, to support a kind of registration of this information. This led to the creation of a kind of open repository that was built within Rollins College's academic commons. Every time there was an event that we participated in, we went to extreme links to document it as much as possible, recording the sessions, taking photographs, um, doing interviews that were turned into the podcast to try to tell the story of Eatonville. We did that for five years, starting about 2016. And as a result, you can go on to Apple iTunes or go on to SoundCloud and find the podcast and see that we've, we've able to document both a kind of ideological landscape where people talk about what Edenville represents as a town, a black town, a historic town, but also talk about what Zoya Hurston's approach to her scholarship represents, how the continuing legacy of a sort of black imaginary represented by the town, rooted in the 19th century, still matters to people all around the world. If I were to be honest with myself, I would have probably continued along that pathway, trying to think about my work as a historian, as a kind of community engagement work that was attempting, at some very basic level, to provide access to the public into the academic sphere, to, to give them voice in a way that allow for their version of events, their stories, their knowledge of how the system operates to be validated in a very particular way. This was really at the core of how we sort of thought about the institutionalization aspect of our work. We wanted to put things in a repository, not because just simply that it was going to be stored, but also because it could be cited. And I was very interested in the idea that there must be some kind of citational justice 
that we can provide to the, the voices and experience of people of color who have long thought about and engaged with systems that they felt were unfair. Understanding their perspective became one way that we could try to alter the overall institutional narratives. We did that sometimes with some success in the case of Gus Henderson, but other times not as successful as I might have hoped. Nonetheless, when I think about this symbol that you see here um, and had to go up for tenure, actually, actually uh, and then I had to go up for, for promotion, I had to come up with some way to explain what I was doing. As long as I worked at Rollins, they, everyone was very nice, but they would often go like, you're not like all the other historians I know, or you're not like any historian I know, which I felt like was worse. Um, and part of that process of educating myself was important because it allowed me to tell a story to my institution that they could follow. And then publications like Public and, and, and organizations like Imagining America became these sort of like references and resources for me to have the language to use to talk about my work. Even as I became much more engaged in digital humanities, it really became an important sort of way for me to triangulate the work that I was doing. Still, when the big boys call, you gotta leave. And I did get asked to come to MSU. Um, this was unexpected. I wasn't necessarily looking to leave, but this was an opportunity that was presented to me, and I took it. But when I did that, I had to ask myself, once again, what exactly am I doing? At the time, I was deeply involved in trying to think through uh, the meaning of Afrofuturism. I had already started doing exhibition work. I, I did a show called Afrofantastic uh, in 2017. I was really interested in the ways that Afrofuturism offered a way to think about or rethink the public record. So when I came to MSU, I really started to think about a, a kind of umbrella that incorporated like the sort of theories of Afrofuturism into the work I was already doing. In fact, black digital humanities arguably is an Afrofuturist practice. And so for me, mapping out the landscapes that were sort of like intrinsic to black spaces became a real sort of focal point of how I was rethinking my work. And so the idea of mapping black imaginaries and geographies, or mapping big, really is, is a way for me to think about a kind of epistemological ecology that is dedicated to trying to understand black spaces through multiple methodological lenses. If you don't know, the definition of Afrofuturism is really a historical definition. It's based on a historical question. Yes, the term is coined by Mark Derry in 1994, a white cultural theorist, but he's really sort of thinking about the question of history and the black experience in history. He's in particular sort of wrestling with the idea at the time, why is it that black people don't, don't deal with science fiction? Now it's important to recognize that he's admitted he was wrong about that. Black people did do science fiction. We've documented it extensively. But his approach to thinking about this question is always something I will give him credit for because he did so through historical lens. He made a lot of historical analogies. He says that when you think about the experience of being a black person in, in the Western context, the experience of slaves were like being alien abductees. He talks about they inhabit, that is black bodies, inhabit a sci-fi nightmare. Right? He talks about their official histories undone. He talks about all these things that make it clear that being black, especially in the Western context, is one where any kind of thought process that we might have has to be challenged. Right? Technology is often brought to bear on their bodies. He's talking about this in 1994. And the fact that it holds up so well, even today, is both sad but also a credit to the historical critique that he's offering. Now, he makes this, this point all as a way to call attention to what Afrofuturism might be. And he, and he gives us a definition, speculative fiction that treats African-American themes and addresses African-American concerns uh, in the context of 20th century technoculture might for, might, for want of a better term, be called Afrofuturism. It's really Alondra Nelson, I think, is a really important figure who further sort of theorizes what this means. And she really calls attention to the way that Afrofuturism is a way to understand um, black cultural production, 
a way to understand uh, modernity from a black perspective. And in the work that she did to do that, I like to call attention to the fact that much of that work was grassroots, it was from the ground up in the context of the Afrofuturist listserv. You don't know what a listserv is, if you're, but it's like people talking on a computer, not like chat, but I deal with a lot of undergraduates, so I know you don't know what a listserv is, but it's cool. Um, and in the internet Wayback Machine, you can go back and find the listserv. That listserv asks some really important questions. The speculation that is Afrofuturism and cultural production that simultaneously represents a past of abduction, displacement, alienation, celebrates a unique aesthetic perspective inspired by the fractured histories and imagined possible futures. It is calling attention to the potentialities around black cultural production. And, and indeed, Alondra Nelson says, why don't we look to black cultural spaces to understand better the experience of modernity, to understand it in a different way, to unpack its negative potentialities. I also call attention to Kojo Oshun because of his really careful understanding of Afrofuturism first and more brilliant than the sun, then later on and further considerations of Afrofuturism where he talks about it as a, a toolkit of recovering counter history, counter futures in a century hostile to blackness. And he calls attention to the future industry. This is my handy dandy sort of diagram of the future industry, in part because he talked very specifically about these different modes of production that are helping to create a kind of imperial archive of the future that's intrinsic to Western colonial thought. And in order to under, undercut that, in order to change that, you have to have what he calls the musological turn. You have to think about something completely different to get to a place where you can do something different. So science fiction is very important in that regard. But speculation is an inherent practice of black people in the Western context because they've had to speculate to achieve liberation. When my students ask me, as they often do, can you define Afrofuturism? I'm like, well, there's a lot of different definitions, but the one I'm gonna tell you because I know you're gonna like bug me about it is speculation and liberation intersecting in the service of African diasporic transformation, right? There are other people thinking about Afrofuturism like Alain, uh, Ronaldo Anderson, and he talks about Afrofuturism as a pan-African cultural practice. And his tendency to see within Afrofuturism a set of practices that cut across multiple spaces of endeavor is an important one. This definition of Afrofuturism offered by him is intrinsic to what he calls a critical Afrofuturist theory, or CRT. And he says Afrofuturism emerges as a response to transformation of African people through oppressive forces, right? So for Afrofuturists and Afrofuturist practice, there is a way that we can think about black spaces and black cultural production as a tendency to seek liberation. And I think about this in particular as I continue to engage with black historic spaces, because at some very basic level, these are the people who are most central in a sort of direct line to the speculation around liberation coming out of the end of the Civil War. So places like Eatonville and other historic black communities are important information repositories to a black speculative practice. So what do these black counterpublics tell us? Well, and if you have not heard, Eatonville is in the midst of a bit of a cultural struggle around space. A historic institution called the Hungerford School, which was founded in 1897, is up for uh, be sold by the Orange County School Board. And this has been the, the, the product of a national debate. This is actually a CBS News Sunday morning story where they, they covered it. But I think the Eatonville story highlights how African Americans have been theorizing about freedom um, since the 19th century, and understanding the sort of battle around Hungford in particular is increasingly emerging as a way for me to think about the nature of black counterpublic practice. Now, it's important to recognize there's a long tradition, as I say, when we're rereading the Florida story, and key figures that already exist in the narrative of black history, like a T. Thomas Fortune, who came from Florida, whose parents were 
uh, Reconstruction era, his father was a Reconstruction era lawmaker who had to run from possible violence. These are people who already in the digital public record have told us stories about the dangers associated with capitalism, the nature of oppression, and offered up narratives to try to counter it. Fortune's work on class and race in the South are important, but I increasingly try to think about the ways that understanding not just simply these individuals, but the spaces and places that they intersect with offer important sort of pathways to understanding their vision of freedom. So there is a lot of work here I'm trying to build on in the context of this. This is a great book by Paul Ortiz, Emancipation Betrayed, where he's already sort of talked about the ways that there was an insurgent African-American freedom culture in Florida that celebrated and challenged, celebrated freedom and challenged white supremacy, but had to deal with the violence that are associated with that. Works like A Nation, a Nation, a Nation Under Our Feet um, call attention to the ways that African Americans approach the question of, of collective work through kinship networks, uh, through communication, through cooperation. And we can see in the record the ways that African Americans are trying to chart multiple paths to try to deal with the changing political landscape in Florida. All these things, though, um, pale in comparison, I think at some level, to the kind of networks of cooperation that, I, that increasingly are central to how Eatonville saw, saw itself in conjunction with Booker T. Washington. And while Washington himself is a problematic figure for a number of people, even today, when I talk to residents in Eatonville, they will talk about them themselves and Eatonville being a Washingtonian town, that they are part of a Washingtonian tradition. Granted, these are older people, but even the younger people have elements of the same philosophy that they work into their narratives, even if they don't necessarily reference Booker T. Washington. And you can see it very clearly in some of the public outcry associated with the question of property. What does that mean? Well, I think one of the things that is important to recognize is that for people in Florida, as, as historians have documented, they saw themselves as constructing a kind of alternative world. This constructionist view that they articulated, that Florida supporters of, of Booker T. Washington articulated, were very particular in their assertion that unlike Washington, who may be, you know, you think of as accepting segregation, they saw this as a period of work that was necessary before they would press for a different kind of action that would be political. The data argument here is important, and one of the things that's increasingly um, sort of a, 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 a sort of subset of my concerns around this is to sort of think through how the idea of telling the story of blackness at an earlier period in the 19th or the 20th century is calling attention to this constructionist view. Because I, I want to make the argument um, in a piece that I'm working on right now that part of the way that they do that is through data. That they're telling a different story about blackness and they're publishing that story and they're circulating that story and they're often directly interfering or interjecting or creating a context to celebrate their story. Zordon Hurston, of course, is a product of the culture of Eatonville. And that in itself is an interesting story because our, our narratives about Zordon Hurston um, tend to focus on the fact that she was in opposition, especially uh, as she, at the height of the civil rights movement against desegregation. And one of the things that I would often talk to my students about, and they would be able to ask me about, is how could she be against desegregation? And I think one of the things that she made clear is that she wasn't necessarily, she wasn't against civil rights. She was against the potential of white people's understanding of blackness destroying black children if they're in white schools. That was her concern. And as she always made it clear, you know, if white people did not like her, what does she care? How much satisfaction can I get from a court or from somebody else so she, who does not wish to be near me? Her arguments are actually at some level directly connected to the similar arguments that you can see being made in the work and efforts of community-based organizations in Edenville at the turn of the century. 
I can see this in the work and the words of people who are interviewed in Every Tongue Got to Confess. So I can go back and see like, oh, I see a similar set of thoughts about the sort of centrality of blackness, the rejection of the marginalization associated with blackness, and a sort of celebration of community and culture intrinsic to Hurston's work and contemporary people. But I can also see that that idea that's being presented in those works can be grafted back to a set of practices with institutions that are very important to our contemporary debate. So are these black spaces an alternative system? Well, one way that this idea of what black success could be was documented was through the work of the Negro Yearbook, a publication that was designed to be, at some level, a data repository of the progress of African Americans in the early part of, or really the early part of the 20th century. It was created by Monroe Work, who is a key figure, and I think a figure that's underappreciated because unlike, um, he was one of the few people able to work both with Booker T. Washington and with W.B. Du Bois. And a University of Chicago trained uh, status sociologist, his work with Washington actually came after um, W.B. Du Bois turned down the opportunity to come to Tuskegee. Eventually, Monroe Work takes the job working for Washington, and in part, his initial work is supposed to be on alumni, but very quickly becomes a work that is focused on trying to provide accurate information about black people at a time where negative and inaccurate information is all that is available. The Negro Yearbook is a way for him to do that. So one of the things that I think is easy to document and that becomes a, a crucial part of this is the way that his experience as a data scientist is a bridge between the sort of disparate areas of activism associated with Washington and Du Bois and the work that he's being offered in the Negro Yearbook is sort of recognized around the country in different newspaper accounts as um, an attempt on the part of the Tuskegee Institute to provide clear, accurate information about black people at a time when that information is not available. Now, it's a complete run of the Tuskegee Yearbook is available at Tuskegee University. But one of the things that's uh, really interesting to me is because it was created by um, Monroe Work, and it's basically tabular data that's locked in a form that is documenting black spaces, black institutions, black people and their actions at a time where many places were not, not being recorded in any meaningful way. Uh, if you go into these yearbooks, especially those ones that are available in a, a digital public record, you can see a kind of systematic attempt to, to tell us who the people are, where they are, what they're doing, their success over time, and their, and their abilities. And this information becomes, I think, at some level, a snapshot of a kind of momentum being articulated by the network of activism that we associate with Booker T. Washington through his business work, through his education work, and through the followers of Washington, even if not Washington himself, through the people who believe in this constructionist approach. So for me, the idea that we can think through uh, a kind of different kind of data argument about success, a different kind of data argument that is in, inspired by black people's sort of critical understanding of the nature of um, American experience is locked in in volumes like this, in the other ways that graduates of Tuskegee Institute and educational institutions they created um, become sort of focal points of local activism. And that too is one of the ways that I sort of think about this because as I'm looking at the, the legacy of the Hungerford School, it's linked to this system in a very particular way, not just simply as a normal and industrial school that is a boarding school in Florida that's attracting residents from not just simply Central Florida but from around the state, but also as a part of a kind of national network where ideas about education, ideas about progress are being farmed out, not just simply to the, the students themselves, but to residents around the region. So the Hungerford School, it does exist in the digital record telling these stories. 
And yes, it's celebrated by uh, Booker T. Washington. He pays a lot of attention to Eatonville and publications like Negro and Business. And the Eatonville speaker really makes clear how that constructionist view plays itself out on the ground. This is a newspaper where they say, if you want to solve the race problem in the United States, they advocate that you bribe property in Eatonville. And while Eatonville is one of several black towns that are created in uh, that period of the 1890s, late 1880s, 1890s, it's clear that for its residents and for other people who are looking to these black towns, it offers an opportunity to craft an alternative vision that can be articulated in the face of this sort of rising Jim Crow segregation of the period. Increasingly, as I continue to look for this story, I can see people being drawn to Eatonville, being drawn to the Hungerford School to learn, to act, to organize. And it becomes, I think, an important sort of part of the legacy that drives the contemporary activism that's associated with trying to preserve the Hungerford School even today. No matter where I look, I can always find it as a part of a, a story of progress that's being channeled to black, black people across the country. And, and this, these ads from the Crisis Magazine in 1922 are prime examples of that. So if that's true, and, and, and there's a story to be told here about sort of alternative system that tells the story of black people and progress that is intrinsically um, challenging these assumptions about modernity, about commerce, about economy. Um, can a more liberated archive be a vehicle for that? Well, one of the things that's a challenge for myself and for any scholar is, is that our timeline for activism is not the timeline of activism of real life. Um, so this, this screenshot is from that news story from um, CBS Sunday Morning, and that lady is in Wine and Fury, right? The powerhouse behind uh, the Associated Preserve Eatonville community. The Associated Preserve Eatonville community is, is the, the main sort of plaintiff in a lawsuit by the Southern Property Law Center uh, connected to the idea of the redevelopment of the Hungerford property. One of the sort of prime narratives around this is that when the Hungerford property, and this is another news story, um, this is on the website of the Southern Poverty Law Center. But this picture is from 1945, and the reason I, I bring it up is because like one of the prime narratives about why the Hungerford property went from um, being owned by a trust associated with the community to being owned by the Orange County History's Orange County School Board is really a pivotal question about narratives created in the archive but never challenged, right? So um, over the last, and I do mean weeks, uh, myself and my colleague Scott have been like, he's been in Florida digging through the, the, the record. I've been in, in, in Michigan digging through the record, trying to tell this sort of like holistic story of the Hungerford property. And because Scott's actually in Florida, he was able to go into like one of the local archives and find a newspaper that hasn't been digitized, where they tell the story of what happened. And while I, I don't want to try to go through the entirety of this story right now, the general narrative about why the property was turned over was that the Hungerford School, which is a boarding school, by the time it got to the end of the 1940s, was running out of money. And they said that that school was running out of money because more and more of the students from Eatonville were going there and the number of boarding students were declining. And so therefore, in order for the school to stay open, we're gonna sell it to the Orange County School Board. That's not exactly what happened, right? So when we start to look at these newspaper accounts, what we start to see is a much more complicated story of the fact oh, yes, it's true that there were more students that were coming from Eatonville, but there were still many students that were bored and coming from all across the state. The school was not financially strapped. It had a lot of money, it had a lot of property, but what it did not have was um, trustees that were necessarily black and two trustees that were necessarily committed to it remaining a black institution. And under the pressure of that, 
the idea of selling the school to the school board made sense, especially as the school board became increasingly concerned about the question of equalization. That with the challenge associated with desegregation, will we have to build a new school for students of color, or could we take over another structure? And when we're going through these, these documents and, and, and looking at these stories, we can see that in fact, there were plenty of people at the time who were saying, no, don't sell this school because it's a black school, has an educational mission that is inspired by Eatonville's sort of like vision of freedom. Um, and indeed, one of the things that's really important is that Mayor McLeod Bethune came forward with a, um, a plan to make the, the Hungerford School into a preparatory school for Bethune-Cookman College. And she had um, a sort of like bullet point plan for why that was necessary, why it was important. It'd be a laboratory for teachers. Uh, they would exchange the trustees to have people who are more in inclined to protect the sort of educational intent of the institution. Um, they would work with the board to prepare a budget. Again, from what we can tell, the school was not in any financial trouble. Uh, all this is a way to sort of brought this sort of momentum created to sell, sell the property. Uh, but ultimately, despite the sort of back and forth that we're able to document, and it's important to recognize that while we're, we're finding these things, some of them are not, they're not all in the same place. And so when Scott's finding stuff and he sends it to me, I'm like, oh, where was that? Like it was, it was buried under this thing, like, oh, great. Um, but we're able to sort of like tell this story in a more holistic way. So our, our ultimate goal is to perhaps have a historical narrative that's more accurate, more effective in sort of supporting the narrative of transformation and legacy that's associated with the hunger for school that's so important to the residents. This is one development story, but obviously over the years I've been able to sit in a room with residents where they sort of think about development in a more holistic way. So again, when you hear stories about Eatonville, people are like, well, this is against development, against progress. No, that's not true. This was a, a urban design league exercise where they sort of like test out how to do development. Like they looked at, you know, mock CFPs and things like that. They were like, okay, what do we need to do to create like a, an effective block? What do we need to do? And it was resonance. They were just sitting there and, and doing the work of trying to figure out how to, how, to, how to make an effective town. So they are not opposed to progress. What they are talking about is justice. So it ain't legal per se. What they are talking about is justice. And, and the work that we're trying to do, I think ultimately is attempting to create a context to understand that, that, that call for justice. So um, as I think about the work I've done with the, the, the Associated Missouri Eatonville community, I've done a lot over the years, and I've always been impressed by the commitment to history that's at the core of the, of, of the residents there. I also recognize that not everything I've done has been as effective as I would like, but at the same time, with these sort of pivotal questions about the future being argued right now, the work that we do as historians, as scholars, as academics, to try to create a context to understand the critiques, the demands, and the actions of residents in places like this is not something that we, we should um, belittle in any way. Every little bit matters, and every sort of effort on our part to try to create clarity around the processes that get us to the contemporary moment are important to that very real question of what we can do to create a better tomorrow. So thank you. And I did it with 40 seconds, seconds, 47 seconds left. So all right, I'm so good. No. Thank you so much, Julian. I think this is working. Great. So I'd like to open up the floor to some questions. Uh, 
or I'll take the prerogative of um, having the mic on my lapel to ask <laughs> questions, but I'd like to open the floor first. And you have to use the mic when you ask the question because no one can hear you on the live stream. Even if you think you're really, really loud, just, I'm just telling you what the, the tech guy told me. He's so happy. Okay, well, thanks for coming. <laughs> We've got a question. Oh, okay. Claire has a question. Yeah, it's not turned on. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Um, so my question is really basic, and I just want to know what so far has been the most rewarding part of your work? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's two answers to that question. Um, the first answer is once I was doing a project in a cultural center, and a lady who knew me for like, I'm not kidding, like five years, she came up to me, and we had, I had said something or did a presentation. He's like, oh, now I trust you. Like, you know me for five years? <laughs> OK, thank you. OK. <laughs> I was like, yeah. But uh, another answer is, uh, when I got tenure, because like they had to write, rewrite the uh, tenure promotion guidelines, because I was I was I was weird. Like remember I said like super weird, and so they were looked at the guidelines and looked at me, looked at the guidelines, looked at me like this is not gonna work. We're gonna rewrite these, and I was like good, right? Yeah, that's awesome. And so I was able to get tenure, and then able to get promoted, right? So I was like yeah, that's that's awesome. Cause that you know better to have a job and not be homeless, so. Hi, thank you for the very inspiring presentation. Um, I have a question about archives. If you um, have had experiences with, with community, with your community engagement work where there's um, skepticism about where archives will go, um, and if you have thoughts on whether archives should go official into institutions, what the tensions of that are versus digitized archives. Can they be, um, can it be both? Like, you know, especially from the um, perspective of um, advancing activism for racial justice, do you see pros and cons to either? And what are some strategies you'd recommend? Yeah, um, there's never been a moment where we didn't argue about archives. Uh, Never, like last week, right? Like it's always a thing. So there are two sort of ways that I think we've approached it over, over time. One is when we think about the archives of, of the work around the Eatonville, for instance, we're particularly documenting a moment and people, but we don't necessarily have artifacts from the community. And part of the reason is like they don't want to give them to us. And instead, what we've done over the years is we've worked with them to write grants for community archives. Um, and you write a grant, you don't necessarily get it. So like, obviously, we haven't got any of those grants. But we've, we've, we've done that more than one time. Like, I've worked with them to like, OK, you have a, an archive. Let's write a grant and try to, try to get it. Um, We've, we've tried as much as possible always to have a kind of open archive as the baseline. And so that means that for them, you know, who gets to talk is a choice. Like, it's not like we make up a list and, and they show up. It's more like we sit around and do you want to talk to us? And, and that, that becomes a thing. We, not every community organization is the same. So, some of it has to do with the level of institutional knowledge the organization has and how they understand uh, academia. So for the community organization that we work with right now, you know, the Edenville organization, they understand academia 
very well from their perspective. And so that's part of the reason why they don't want to give us stuff. They only they want like a clear context when uh, archival material is available and, and where it's going to be presented. And, and, they, and they're in, in the position sometimes to be the place where it's presented, right? Because they have spaces where we can come in and, and do things like create exhibitions and do things like that. Um, right now, I think one of the things that we talk about is like really, really sort of thorough community agreements where we sort of figure out, okay, you're going to keep the physical thing, but we're going to have the digital version with this sort of caveat. And, and that's, I think, increasingly the template that most organizations are comfortable with because they understand academia, but they understand like the worst kind of academia, not the best kind of academia. So um, they all have stories, I mean, Eveville in particular, they all have stories of academics that come, do all this stuff, and they never see them again. Because like that was like, oh, I'm, why should I talk to you? I'm never going to see you again. And so when I come back, they're always like shocked at some level. Hey, you came back. Like, I literally live two miles from here. So why would you not expect to see me again, right? Um, they also don't want to come on campus, so we always have to figure out a way to find the space that um, can be the, the place where public discourse can happen. So churches are a huge part of it. Um, I think over time, one of the, the, the things when, when we started to bring um, the Zora Festival on Rollins campus, I did have a conversation where like, you know, it was basically said to me, I need you to guarantee we're going to be treated okay when we come there. And I'm like, don't worry, I will talk to the campus police, I will talk to the president, I will, I will make sure everything is okay. I, and I, in fact, that's what I, I did. I like went to the president, like, you need to talk to the campus police, there are going to be black people here. Not just simply me, right? Like, you know, gonna be black, right? like, you know they're going to be from this time to this time, like, you know, okay. Uh, and it was fine. But, you know, yeah, they were mindful of it because they have a history. Uh, and I think those agreements, which can be complicated to create, are really important because that is the, the certain, that is the guarantee that they have that you're a, a fair partner. To build on Lily's question a little bit, I wonder if you might be able to talk a little bit about meeting community organizations and groups where they are, because that's, that's a challenge, right? Because right. yeah. you have to, you can't have a formula. Right. And, and you can't come with a formula to every organization that's the same. Right. And so it requires different approaches. Yeah. One thing is like your timeline is not their timeline, right? The academic timeline is not a human timeline. So what that does, though, and like this is really important, is like it puts a lot of pressure on the faculty member to um, be the conduit for that. And, you know, I, I, I say to graduate students in particular, uh, you, you gotta, I say to graduate students, one, you gotta get your dissertation done. So like whatever activism, like it's gonna have to, you, you, you know, you gotta balance it out. But when you're a faculty member, you have to tell a story and there's a, you have to develop a schema where your interactions with the community are the steady state and, you're, and, and the products have to come out in a manner that makes sense to them. So you can't be like, hey, I got a three year grant. You really have to think, I have a semester. I have 10 weeks this semester. I'm gonna do a thing. Because you have to show the community something. Like you really have to show them something because otherwise they're like, what did you do? Because they don't have, right? Like they just don't have. So you gotta show them something and you gotta show it in a way that they can they can take it. So like even then when we did digital things, the idea like, well, there has to be a physical thing that people like a poster or a podcast, you know, like, you know, we would do community presentations. Like we would go to where they were, like, okay, we did all this research, this was here's, here's what we what we found, and here's your copy. Um, because otherwise you're gonna lose them. Because like they are living a life and you are doing an academic thing. So you, you, you as, the, as the sort of professor, are on a tremendous amount of pressure to 
be the face to them, but you also have this pressure from your institution. So you know, you, you kind of have to me you have to manage that that in between space, like the idea that um, you're a bridge is all that's the good version, but you know you're a, a a joint that gets broken is a bad version. So you really you really have to figure out a way to manage that and and. Some of it depends on the institution that you're at because all institutions are not the same. And so, you know, what is your institution's narrative becomes really important. Um, part of the reason why community engagement as a field was so important to me is that under that rubric, we had a lot of debates about we're working with the community, where does that count? Like, if you're a historian, most departments write their tenure and promotion you have to publish in a historical journal. But if you do a community engagement work, it's interdisciplinary by default. So you, you know, at one point, um, I did this whole thing where I had to go and look and try to find journals that historians that pu can publish in that are public, you know, they're kind of, mm -hmm. you know, public history. And like public stories is a fine example, but you have to do that for every discipline. Like, because you're an anthropologist, yeah, okay, maybe, but it, it's really complicated. And, and that part of it, they don't tell you. And, and you're on a clock to get tenure. And so, <laughs> like, they don't, they don't I, I, I think probably institutions are better at it now, uh, in part because there's way more emphasis on, you know, public impact now. Mm -hmm. uh, but the impacts that are measurable are very particular. And you know, th this is this is his own lecture. I feel like, but uh, it is definitely something that you have to have a conversation with your chair about. This is something that you have to, you know, at review time also, if, as the scholar, have to have really, really clear sort of moments to talk about that. That was one of the things I I, I came to understand. If I don't make it clear that I'm doing something, they'll think I was doing it because I was black. And I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe, but I'm also a historian, so um, doesn't that count? Like, no, I'm not just doing it because I'm black. Like that, no, that's not, that doesn't work. Um, that, that is a, yeah. I'm not, I, mm, uh, this is being recorded. Okay. Because the conversations that preceded the changes to the promotion and tenure guidelines, I think, you know, were not simple. No, were, right. Were messy and required a, a certain kind of, you, you speak of that joint or that, that right, required yeah. the flexible, nimbleness that maybe some places just aren't prepared to have. But those conversations were probably quite thorny to get to a place where they could both acknowledge the blackness because of the work that you're doing right, and yeah. also that there is scholarship there and there's intellectual work there. Right, yeah. That, that part um, is, is definitely true. I think the triangulation of it has to do with making connections outside the institution, being able to, to tell, tell the story of the work within a, a national or international framework. So I could always say, like, I'm not the only person doing this. I'm the only person doing it here, but I'm not the only person doing it, right? Like, you know, um, and documentation and um, valuation through review or through, so like even, it's silly, because uh, now you, I'm older, but, <laughs> Because like every, every grant matters when you're doing work that's odd, right? Because that's a different set of people who don't work at your institution going like, oh yeah, this makes. Mm -hmm. So even if, it's a, even if it's a small grant and you're doing something that's involving the community, it, it kind of matters because it becomes a way in the narrative of the work that you're doing that you can explain the value, right? So 
Humanities Council grants or mm -hmm. um, Community Foundation grants, even if they're really tiny. And you know, you know, I work at R1 now, so like grants aren't necessarily really tiny. But when you're working at smaller institutions, that really matters because it creates a context to let them know that you are doing something that's real, mm -hmm. that is not just simply about you. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because, like, you know, you said in my my bio, and I did not study African American history. Mm -hmm. I'm an urbanist. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. Like I studied planning in my dissertation. So there are black people in the city, true. <laughs> But I didn't study African American studies like that. You know, I just arrived at a place and they were like, you're black, you can teach African American history. And my advisor always told me, uh, Jeff Adler, great guy, uh, you're going to be asked, can you teach a class? Say yes. And I'm like, all right. So they asked me, can you teach African American history? I said, yes. Can you teach this? Yes. I mean, yes. Right. I never once said, they said in class, can you teach it? I never said no. I always said yes. So even when it was weird, I'm like, what? Yes, right? <laughs> OK. I mean, I, you know, it worked out. All right. And those, and those grants, though, also help to make the case for why the humanities matter. That's why they're also important. Right, yeah. Because they, they give you those ins to making the case to people when they don't understand why the humanities matter. Right, right. He, yeah. Here are the openings. Those are those key moments. Yeah, and, and it's probably easier than you imagine. Some, a lot of these grants people don't necessarily apply for because they're so tiny sometimes. And you know, I, I'm talking like $1,000 or uh, $500 or, or $1,500. And at that level, you know, community organizations, community foundations, they have these things to, to work with the community. And you can fit them in to your work and it would not be that complicated, but but you're trained coming out like you need to get an NEH grant. I'm like that's true, that's great, but these little grants actually are, are proof of concept a lot of times, yeah. and and air, they become stepping stones to telling this bigger story. And you know you will get into this place. I think you often get in this place when you're doing community-based work, where like there are elements of the university or the institution that love you and elements of the university that don't understand you, and elements of the university are just hostile, right? And you can pick who those people are in your head, but they will exist at all times. And the people who tend to like you, though, are like the PR people, because they're like, you do stuff and people understand it. That will be the first thing out of my mind. Hey, you did this thing and people understood that. Could you do another thing that people understand? I'm like, Okay, thanks. Um, sure, right? I'm going to teach this class again. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, so, it's, it is, your department usually is the place where you're sad but, sad but true. That's usually the place where you're having the most trouble. Because, like, your older colleague, now I'm the older colleague, <laughs> your older colleague is going to be like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? And you're gonna have to like, you know, explain it patiently over and over again. Mm -hmm. Over and over again. Julian, I wonder whether you would let us in a little bit more as to what this work has meant for your students. Because you very early on in your talk said, classroom as platform and clearly the work that you have done has involved the community and it has also involved students and I'm also curious in that context whether there is a difference for you there between doing the work in Ro at Rollins and doing it now at Michigan State. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's been, it was super transformative for students because of course for most of them it's a predominantly white institution. Um, so for most of them, a lot of issues represented by the work they were doing were not things that they were cognitive. You know, they, they weren't thinking about it. And, and because we were doing, you know, really archival work, and I, I very quickly developed like a spectrum of work. Because since I was a constant, I was always concerned with like, okay, the black social world in Central Florida was how I would frame it, the communities 
a practice, like what are we gonna do? And it didn't matter what class I was teaching, I would just sort of shape the engagement to the class. So if we were um, teaching, if I was teaching a class America since 1945, then it would be a post-war engagement and I would look at blah. If I was teaching African American history one, it would be like, okay, well, slavery, and, and so we're gonna do blah. Uh, but we're, it's always gonna be about Central Florida, right? It's always gonna be that. And so if you were a first or second year student in my class, we would be doing very archi archival heavy things. Going to the archive, reading the archive, they would be writing. We, uh, there was a project out of um, the University of Richmond called the History Engine, which ran for for many years is no longer active, but it, it was a, a project created by Ed Ayers and you did these things called, um, uh, what do they call them? They were little narrative snippets that, so you would get a primary source document from the archive and you would marry that primary source document with secondary sources to tell a story. So say you got a photograph of a person from 1910 and so the student would have to figure out, well, what's, uh, what is this photograph an entryway to? Like what kind of indirect, what kind of historical? So if it was a woman, for instance, she was wearing a dress, one student might do a thing about, okay, women's corsets. Because, you know, they were an art student. I had a student do the, like, I want to do something about women's corsets. I'm like, okay. But another student might do something about, like, what's marriage like for a woman, right? And all of those would go into the history engine. And that was a thing I would do almost every year for several years. Like if you were first, second year student, we would do that. And then if you were upper division student, then you get to go out to the community. Because like if you're a history major, I saw you at the first year and I could teach you about primary sources, about you know reading, reading the archive, we can go to the archive, learn about sort of like critical librarianship, all these other things. And then you could marry that with like more direct control interactions when you were a junior or a senior. So I would do projects where they would do these really sort of deep oral histories and then turn those oral histories into like audio documentaries. So if you go to that community, like the whole reason there's, well, yeah, it's true. The whole reason there's a community tab in the um, Rollins College um, scholarship is because of me, because all that stuff in there is me. Like I was, I was involved in almost all of it. So like when you go and you listen to these different things, it's like, oh, that was at that thing, and that was at that thing. And, and so that was the difference. And for the students, they would come away with like a greater understanding of things like gentrification. Uh, they would definitely understand things like you know, racial justice. Um, it's ironic because uh, I did a project uh, about a lynching uh, about a man named Oscar Mack. And, that project was in 2013, and this year, tonight, they're premiering a documentary about it. Mm. Um, and and it, was, it was one of those things where we just had this sort of archival material given to us by a community member, and we just worked on it, and we were able to like find out details about this, this lynching. And an important thing to know is like he got away. It was reported that he was lynched, but he got away. And one of the things that happened is that once we did all this research about the incident, his family contacted us. It was like, this is the name that I, our great grandfather mentioned that he used to have. And, and so a couple of years ago, I actually was able to go up to Ohio where he escaped to and they relayed his headstone with his, his real name and his, 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 um, the name he took on, Lanier Johnson. So, you know, we, we, over the years, you have multiple incidents where students were, would talk about like, yeah, this is really transformative. Um, at MSU, it's a lot different. I don't do the same kind of um, community-based work right now, uh, in part because I'm working with a lot more graduate students. And the work that I have done, it's been around Afrofuturism, so it's been like making. So it's been students making things that are Afrofuturist inspired. Um, and I, I did recently, just last year, work with uh, what we call Spartan Studio. And that was a class that was looking at uh, working with two community organizations around, one was a, a kind of developer and the other one was a maker space. And in that class, I was helping them sort of use like an Afrofuturist lens 
to think about ways to make those spaces or those processes more liberatory. So it's a little bit different because, yeah, I don't get to teach. The, the things I teach now are very different. And it's a little bit more complicated for me to uh, think about um, community-based work. We do, we have, I've done archival work. So I've done a project called Critical Fanscapes where I'm having students look at fanzines and, and fan culture and, and creating more nuanced understanding of fan culture using race, gender, class um, frameworks, the making stuff like, okay, I want you to make a series of posters inspired by Afrofuturist logics um, and, and other work and work like that. But I still work with Edenville, but it's often, you know, in a very sort of like administrative-ish, like curating kind of perspective. So it's interesting. The work I do with graduate students is probably the closest because a lot of them have community-based things. I'm like, okay, be mindful of this potential threat, right, to your existence. But so we'll see. I, I, I'm uh, working with a museum, and and that also has a, a particular kind of community engagement. I do a lot of um, when I've done exhibitions previously. Um, I did an exhibition on comics in Afrofuturism. And there were a lot of community talks involved in that. And that's been a lot of outreach. And we think a lot about the ways that we can get that information out to community. And then we're developing one, another exhibition right now about Afrofuturism and sound. And that will be really interesting because then we'll really be sort of engaging with Detroit, I think, with that project. Question up front. Um, hello, this has been amazing. Um, I'm Dr. Nevis, you're fantastic, but I'm very jealous of your students. Um, <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, you said that you worked with like maker spaces to make um, libraries, maker spaces more liberatory. Mm -hmm. And you're talking so much about um, bringing students into the archive. So I was wondering if you could speak to how you've made those spaces more liberatory. And also if you were to redo an academic library and archive in a way that is more liberatory and does facilitate that, what, what would, would that look be? like? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, I've had a lot of great experience with um, librarians who were really interested in a kind of radical librarianship, right? Like a liberatory librarianship. So they were really, they, they understood this was sensitivity around erasure in the archive. And um, especially, especially at Rollins, I think that was one of the, one of the things I always did is I took them to the library and had the librarians talk about, you know, the fact that librarianship itself, of the library science, is wrestling with this. Like there is an awareness of the nature of this thing. And um, that's part of the reason why when we think about approaches to documentation, that by, by, by default, it's open, right? Like we, we're not taking the thing, we're making a copy. We're not, you know, we're, we, we, did, we have done history harvest in, in the archive. So, you know, that whole process is like, no, you're gonna get to keep this thing. We just need you to, you know, tell us about it and we're gonna document it and things like that. Um, and when we're doing the work on the ground of, you know, doing that, the more complex sort of nuanced interpretive work, right? Uh, you know, the goal with that interpretive work always is, at least to me, um, is for, the, for us to create a better understanding of the lived experience of the people on the ground within this sort of canonical, historiographical narrative. And, and what, that, what that often means is that we're chipping away little by little at um, some of the presumptions associated with the idea of, oh, this is what happened when we talk about post-reconstruction of America. Because, you know, when students learn it, and they'll, they'll say this, like, well, I, you know, they, all they do is say, like, Civil War, Jim Crow, Civil Rights. And I'm like, well, geez, they, 
they skipped over a lot. And when you're on the ground and you're in the archives, what you're seeing is the way that like that line between freedom and not free is like a fight. And you can see that African Americans are ideating on what is necessary to be free, what is necessary to create space for liberation. So even in the context of some place like Eatonville, where you know, clearly they see themselves in a particular tradition, that doesn't mean that everybody there sees themselves in that tradition. And it also doesn't mean that like, you know, the other black communities around, which are more holistically involved in a struggle around liberation than we give them credit for it, because you go, well, even though it's its own town, and the people in, in the black part of Orlando, well, they don't, they're not connected. I'm like, no, that's not true. They're, they're all in, in, in conversation. Um, they all have similar sort of concerns about what can be done in terms of navigating the, the declining political landscape. I'm, I'm, it's interesting because when you're doing that work, what it does is it complicates in important ways that narrative of like a kind of linear history. And it really calls attention to how important um, every little act of resistance is in terms of like how, how, how people experience their, their everyday life. Because like to them, it's not like, you know, one day we were free and one day we were not. Like, no, um, every time the rise of Jim Crow segregation happened, black people reacted. And that's why they came up with something else. So it's interesting because um, when we were, when I was looking, working with students, we could see middle class black people not making fun of, but like going like, they think, basically saying, do you think this poll tax is gonna keep me from voting? The answer is no, because I have money and I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna vote. So a poll tax ain't enough, right? I'm, they're gonna have to do something else. And that's where you get like, you know, Florida's notorious for its innovation in suppressing voting. Like, yeah, well, that's the truth. Uh, I'm from Florida, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> um, the multiple ballot box, that was another one. You know, the, 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 the literary test. Uh, and then just violence, right? Like at the end of the day, when all else fails, burn it to the ground was like their, their go-to. And even that doesn't necessarily stop people because they'll rebuild. I mean, people forget, they rebuilt Tulsa. Like, yeah, they burned it, but they rebuilt it, right? Like going like, that's not gonna burn us out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's always a question of kind of identifying um, the practices on both sides. And it's really important when you're working with librarians and archivists to have conversations about what it is that you're thinking you're doing. Because they're, you know, because you don't, you're just assuming, like, it, and, and, and librarians and archivists are a lot of pressure, because they're brought up in a system too. And so their system tells them, like, I need the most draconian set of rules and regulations imaginable to get this stuff. And I'm like, they're not gonna sign that, dude. They're, they're not gonna sign this. I'm sorry. Like, I, I, it's not me, it's them. <laughs> but they're not gonna sign it. No, we need to come up with a different one. Like, they're not gonna sign this. Like, I can tell you this right now. This says everything. No black person in this community is gonna sign a thing that says everything. They might sign a thing that says something for a limited period of time, maybe. But everything, no, they're not gonna sign it. Right, they're just not gonna sign it. And you know why they're not gonna sign it, right? Like blah, 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 and like it doesn't matter, they're not gonna sign it. And so you, you kinda have to have that argument, like you know, have that conversation. And then, you know, hey, could we come up with something in negotiation with them that they, was, they will sign? Because most of them, I think most community groups are okay with digital copies. They are, they're, they're totally okay with digital copies. Now you have to have the capacity to do that effectively, right? Like, they don't wanna come to where you are, you gotta go to where they are. You, you need to set aside all day, not an hour, all day, all day. Start early, leave after the sun go down, like all day. 
and and you you can you can do it right like and you you know you need to show up a couple of times just so they know who you are right like you do need to eat with them right like you need to chill like you're not work you are not working on their your clock you're working on their clock like you know so it's like a like an ongoing exercise you can, over time you don't necessarily have to do all of that and, and you can you kind of stand in, in in the stead of the students but you always want to bring if you're working with students you always want to bring them there early and be like these are real people don't do anything to them you wouldn't do to your own mother right like that kind of thing seriously because like they're kids and you're like um like would you say that to your own mother or don't say it to this lady right like you know all of that um, and then, you know, after that first thing, in some training, like, my, I, always, I always would do mock, like, like, practice things with us in class, like, okay, you're this person and you're angry, go. So they would have an experience of, like, what if the person doesn't trust that you're doing the right thing, or, right? And, you know, and there's different things that we would read in anticipation, like, you know, given, and I would often, you know, have like short sort of like reflective assignments built in, sort of get in their capacity to like think through, this happened, this wasn't a, you know, a, an attack on my, my character, this person is working through some stuff. And all that stuff helps, right, because they understand like, oh, okay, this is a process, um, and success, and um, failure isn't necessarily about your grade. You're not being graded. You know the process being a, the process isn't about your grade. The process is about like sort of like honoring these people's thing. And like, I, don't worry about your grade. Your, I would often build projects over an entire semester, in part so the class was about that thing. It wasn't about like even if the class was about America's in 1945. Everything they were doing that was assessed was about the project. So it was contextualizing, getting them ready for, or they were using these sort of like reflective elements in some sort of making project that is trying to contextualize this place in that post-1945 context. So that's the kind of thing that really makes it important. Well, I want to encourage us to move to dinner and uh, continue the conversation. Dinner theater. Thank you so much.